a rhetorical question as we begin. How well do you think we as Christians handle disagreement on important but secondary issues to salvation? In other words, on issues that matter but are not tied to whether we're saved or not, do we disagree charitably or uncharitably, agreeably or disagreeably? So let's start with some social issues. In a moment, I'm going to mention the single most controversial social issues I could think of over the past few years. My point is not what position you should hold on these. My question is, amidst differences within the body of Christ, how do we treat one another amidst these differences? By the way, I'm not going to have you turn and share your perspective on these. Don't worry. (laughs) Vaccines. Immigration. Critical race theory. Gun control. Voting for Trump. Voting for Biden. The reality is we won't. But there are some of you in this room that have a different perspective on every single one of those issues. How do we treat each other amidst disagreement? Now, I'm not saying that all perspectives on these issues are equal. That's not my point. I'm simply saying amidst differences on important issues that are not essentially salvific, how do we treat one another? What about theological issues? Some of the most divisive issues tend to be the role of women in the church and the family, the age of the earth, and what we're in the middle of studying right now, the end times. Do we disagree agreeably and charitably or disagreeably and uncharitably? Now, why is this question important? Because you know what Jesus says in John 13, 35? He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have what for one another? Love for one another. In other words, Jesus says, people are going to look at the world and look at your life and look at my life and know whom we follow and who we call king by whether or not we love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's pretty important we talk about disagreeing well, isn't it? Now, you know, Satan's strategy, of course, Satan is a liar, he's a murderer, and he is a divider. Satan lies, lies, deceives, and divides. So if I take you back about 10 or 12 years to the blockbuster movie at the time called The Avengers, Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, he's going to spoil it. You have had over a decade to see this movie, not to mention the time in COVID. So, spoiler alert is out. You know, what's interesting about this film is the villain is Loki, the half-brother, the brother, uh, adopted brother of Thor. Loki plays a Satan-type figure. He has rebelled against the gods, goes to earth, wants to be worshipped by everybody, and even possesses people, including Hawkeye. But do you know what Loki's strategy in that film is? Loki knows that he can't stand up to the Avengers and defeat them himself. But he knows if he can get the Avengers to fight amongst himself, he can win. So the strategy is to turn Hulk loose to fight against the rest of the Avengers. I saw that, I'm like, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but he's a Satan-type figure who knows he cannot beat God and the church. But if he can distract us by infighting, we have less energy and time to love those who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if we were to go around the room and ask you, do you think we're more divided today as a country and a church, I suspect Probably most of you, if not many of you, would say this is one of the most divided times in recent history. But you know what? That might be true in American history, but it's not true for the church. You go back to Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, about two decades after the church began, guess what Paul is dealing with? Sexual morality, lawsuits among believers, 
and disunity. <laughs> in fact, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, you have people saying, wait, we follow Paul, we follow Peter, we follow Apollos, and still others Christ. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.10, he says, I appeal to you. An appeal means like he pleads to them, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, he doesn't mean agree on every particular thing. He's saying as a whole, be in unity, be in agreement about our big vision so we can have love for one another. And why am I starting this way? Because our topic today is theologically divisive. In fact, as I was prepping for this, I was reading a commentary by Steve Gregg. It's a four views approach to Revelation. And I thought when I was done, I'd have more confidence in my view. But when you read each chapter in four different views, I walked away, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's more division and difference on this than I even realized. What Steve Gray starts with, he said, it is no exaggeration to call this, the chapter we're looking at this morning, the most controversial chapter in the Bible. Now, I'm sure if you posted that on Twitter, you would create disunity and backlash because somebody would say, no, it's Genesis 1 and his entire point would be lost. Whether it's number one or number two or top five, this chapter we're looking at this morning is one of the most divisive chapters. So I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute. If this is one of the most divisive chapters, then why are you a guest speaking on this? <laughs> why isn't Pastor George or Pastor Seth speaking on this? And that's a good question. Seth, where are you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I suspect they sat down and planned this thing out. They're like, I don't know if I want to talk about the millennium. Let's bring someone else in who we can throw under the bus. Actually, what happened is we both agreed to this, and then we both looked at the topic. We're like, oh, okay, this is what I'm preaching on. So let's jump in. We're in Revelation chapter 20, okay? If this time in your faith and in this series you can't find Revelation, you will not be able to find anything in the Bible. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20. We're going to look at about three or four verses stop, and I'm just going to make sure we have clarity. Look at some more verses, clarity, more verses, and then we'll start to kind of discuss it. All right, so Revelation 20, and we'll throw it on the screen, verses 1 through 3. John says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Okay, what happened? You have this image of an angel coming down from heaven, seizing Satan, the dragon, the devil, binding him for a thousand years so he can't deceive the nations in the bottomless pit. And then after the thousand years, Satan is released to cause more havoc. That's all that happened so far. Satan is seized, thrown in the pit for this thousand-year reign, and then he's released. All right, let's look at verses 4 through 6. John says again, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were to those whom authority had been given, uh, judge was, to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image it had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So now what happens? Remember, Angel comes down, casts Satan into the pit for a thousand years so we can't deceive the nations. Now you have those who are not beheaded, martyrs, raised in what's called the first resurrection to reign with Christ as priests for the thousand years. Okay? That's basically the storyline so far. And then we go to the last part, verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. 
And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, probably Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had been deceived, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan is released. And what happens? Gathered this massive group from the four corners of the earth, the size, the sand of the sea. They stand against the beloved city, Jerusalem. But then fire consumes down, destroys them. Satan is thrown into the pit to be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, so in sum, what does this passage say? There's this image of this angel coming down and grabbing Satan and binding him. Throw him into the bottomless pit so he cannot deceive the nations anymore. There's a first resurrection of those who are martyrs, those who are beheaded, to reign as priests for, with Christ for a thousand years. You know what happens? Satan is then released, gathers this whole army, comes against the beloved city, fire consumes them down, which means they lose big time, and Satan, the devil, the serpent, the beast, thrown into now an eternal pit. Got it? Now, this raises a million questions, doesn't it? What is the mark of the beast? Who is the beast and the false prophet? Where is the bottomless pit? Well, here's the reality. I'm not going to answer those questions for you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three broad historical approaches. We've seen within the church to making sense of this passage so you have more of a map, so to speak, to make sense of these questions. Okay? That's where we're headed. So, three views of how Christians have historically approached what's called the millennium, which is this thousand-year period. The first one is called premillennialism. Premillennialism, and simply, if you're theological savvy and you want to sound impressive, you just say, "Yeah, that's me. I'm premill." All right, that's the term. Now, what does this mean? I have a chart that'll come up behind me to help illustrate this. But the thousand years comes after Christ returns. So, those who hold a premillennial view, they believe in a premillennial return of Christ. So the return of Christ, as you look in this chart, you have the first coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago. The church age is where we are now. And then Satan will be bound when Jesus comes back in the future, whether it's tomorrow or 2,000 years plus. And then after that 1,000-year millennial reign, Satan will be released, released final judgment, thrown into the lake of fire. That's the pre-mill view. Now, this view tends to see the world getting worse and worse. Hence, Jesus needs to come back and judge before the millennium, okay? This is classically what's called the pre-mill view. Now, since one is pre-mill, the other one you can widely guess is called what? Post-mill. You guys are sharp. I don't care what Pastor Seth says compared to the first service. That extra sleep helps. Post, I'm kidding, it wasn't Pastor Seth, it was George. Um, Post Mill says Jesus returns after the millennium. So there's a thousand year reign yet in the future. And after this thousand year reign, Jesus will come back. So on this view, our culture or the world is going to increasingly become more and more Christianized before Jesus comes back. Whether this is through evangelism, revival, the church, this future millennial state will happen and the world will be brought under dominion of Christ and then Christ will return. It's post-millennial. Jesus comes back after the millennium. So if you look on this chart up here, you have the first coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago. In the church age, Satan is bound in this world itself, and then we have the thousand years, and then you have Satan released and finally defeated. 
Okay, so the millennium is future at some point where Satan will be found. We'll have this millennial reign here where the world becomes more and more Christianized, and then Satan will be released, final judgment. Okay, so pre-mill sees the world getting increasingly bad before Jesus comes back. Post-mill sees the world getting increasingly Christianized. Can you see why this is divisive? It affects the way we think about culture. It affects the way we read the moment of history that we're in. It might affect the way we pray. Now, the third view is called awe millennialism. Now, take a wild guess what sophisticated awe millennialists might call themselves. <laughs> this is the participatory part of the program. <laughs> awe mills. Pre-mill, post-mill, awe mill. Now, this view denies that there's a literal thousand-year reign of Christ. In other words, they interpret the millennium or the thousand years symbolically or spiritually as the moment we're in now between when Jesus first came and his second coming. We are in the millennium according to this view. So if you look, first coming of Jesus when Christ says it is finished, Satan was bound when Jesus first came. We are in the church age, which is the thousand year reign, and then Satan will be released at some point in the future and will have the final judgment and on into the future of the new creation. That's called a uh, mill. Now, the question you're wondering is which should I choose? Which position should I hold? Now, I suspect some people asked, some of you are thinking, what does this church hold? What do you hold? You're a professor. You must have it figured out. Now, sometimes I think people ask me this question because they want me to think for them. Sometimes we ask questions because we're like, well, if that person holds it, I'm safe, rather than doing our own thinking ourselves. Now, we can't think through every single issue. I get that. But rather than telling you exactly what I hold and why, although if you know Biola as an institution, given that I teach there, you could pretty easily figure it out. Let's talk about how we handle important but secondary theological issues. I would argue that's more important because remember, they won't know us by our perfect theology, as important as theology is. They will know us by our what? Our love and we're called to unity. So first, how do we choose? Number one, realize there's impressive arguments for each view. There are impressive arguments for each of the three views that you've seen. So if your initial reaction is, oh, those two are obviously wrong, my suspicion is you haven't at least taken those arguments seriously. So in his commentary on Revelation, Steve Gregg says, each of these can present impressive exegetical arguments in its defense. And each has been advocated by impressive conservative scholars. Impressive conservative scholars. And each has enjoyed its own period of prominence in the thinking of the Western church. So all-mill, pre-mill, post-mill, Number one, there's good arguments for East. Number two, solid Bible-believing Christians who are influential in the church have held them. And each in a different historical period has had some prominence. I'm not saying they're all right. I'm simply saying that's a reality with this issue. Second, there are criticisms of each view. Now, there's entire books written on this. I'm not pretending to go into the depth here. But take, for example, premillennialism. If you could show, throw the chart up there again. Remember, premillennialism is the second coming is in the future, and then there'll be the thousand-year reign. Some would say, wait a minute, this implies two returns of Christ, doesn't it? Jesus comes back before the millennium, then he comes back again after the millennium. Critics of premillennial would say that doesn't square with Scripture. It seems that there's one return of Christ. Now, of course, premillennials have their response to this, but these are where the debates go. That's a fair question that if you're premillennial, you should make sense of. Others would say premillennial view doesn't take seriously the power of the gospel to change lives and change society. That's what postmillennial would say. So these are the kind of criticisms. If you're premill, you need to consider and make sure you have a good answer for it. What about postmill? Well, remember, postmill says we're going to have this Christianized dominion of Christ in the world before Jesus comes back, those against post-mill would point to passages that say, you know what, that doesn't square with scripture. 
Scripture seems to teach, like Jesus in Matthew 24, that the world is going to get a lot worse before Jesus comes back. So how do we square that with Scripture? Post Mills will say they have their answer, but that's a fair question. Others would say, just like arguably pre-mill, according to some, doesn't take seriously the power of the gospel, some would say post-mill doesn't take seriously the depravity of human beings. To say that we can have a Christianized world and Christ is going to have dominion in this world before he comes back, that doesn't take seriously Mark 7 and Roman 3 and the depravity and sinfulness of human beings. That's a criticism raised against post-millennialism. Now, amillennialism, some would say if you throw the chart of amillennialism back up there, Satan was bound at the first coming according to Amill. So critics might say, if you think Satan was bound, you are not taking seriously the power of Satan in the present to affect us and to cause havoc within the church. Now, again, all mills have their answer or what they think is a good answer, but that's a fair question. Others would say because all millennial tends to interpret things metaphorical, metaphorically and symbolic that they miss that Revelation is talking about historical events in the past and the future and maybe makes things too spiritual. That would be a criticism. So remember, we're talking about which view do we take seriously. First thing to keep in mind is there are impressive arguments for each view. Second, there's also criticisms of each view that we need to take seriously. Third, this is not an issue of biblical authority, faithfulness, or inerrancy. This is not an issue on the left or the right. So a lot of political issues tend to be divided on the left and the right. The question of the millennium is not a question of whether you think the Bible is true, authoritative, inspired. It's not really a question of conservative versus liberal. It's a question conservative, Bible-believing Christians differ over. Okay, so as you pick a view, keep that in mind. Now, fourth, let me suggest that we approach a topic like this with humility. With humility. Now, by the way, humility is not opposed to conviction. Conviction is about the strength of what we believe. You can have convictions, but still be a humble person. Don't confuse me saying we should approach this with humility with saying all views are equal. That is not my point. But do you know in the passage we read, I don't know if you were counting or paying close attention, we read 10 verses. Do you know the millennium is mentioned six times in those 10 verses? Six times. In 22, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. It's nowhere else explicitly mentioned in Scripture. Now those, whatever view they hold, people will say these other passages talk about the millennium in a different fashion, and I get that. But this is the only passage that explicitly and directly addresses the millennium. Can we see how different that is than, for example, the resurrection. <laughs> All four Gospels, the letters of Paul, in fact, in the book of Acts, they thought resurrection was a God because Paul and the apostles were preaching so much about the resurrection. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 to 17, Paul says, if Jesus is not risen, your faith is what? It's in vain, it's worthless, we're to be pitied. So the resurrection is what we call a central core issue that if you don't believe it, you are not a follower of Jesus because you don't believe Jesus has conquered the grave. <laughs> not only does the resurrection show up all over the New Testament, but our salvation is tied to it. So our view of the millennium, again, important, but we should have some humility because it's not tied to salvation, and because it's really mentioned in one passage and not in other places. Compare that again with the gospel. <laughs> with the gospel. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul is very clear about the importance of getting the gospel right. Right? 
That is a letter written to people who are seeping in different works like circumcision. And Paul starts off in Galatians 1.8. What does he basically say? If anyone preaches a false gospel, let him be accursed. And then Paul says, let me repeat it again just in case you missed it. If anyone preaches a false gospel, let this person be accursed. The gospel is explained and taught through all of the New Testament and central to our faith. Again, the millennium, important, but not central like that. Third, it's also not like what we see in 1 John, for example, where John says to the effect of, if any spirit proclaims that Jesus did not come in the flesh, that person is an antichrist. So there are certain issues that are central to our faith. We have to believe to be Christians. And if somebody doesn't believe them, they can say they're a follower of Jesus, but they're not. I think we should have some humility, which is not opposed to conviction, when we talk about something like the millennium, because it's really in one passage, and again, not tied to salvation. So when people ask me my view, for example, what do you think about the millennium? When people ask me when I teach on intelligent design, one of the most common questions I get is probably weekly, someone goes, well, what is your view on the age of the earth? My answer is to say, great question. (laughs) Now, I am not inclined, actually, to quote Pirates of the Caribbean, I am disinclined to acquiesce to that request. (laughs) Not because I haven't thought it through and I don't have convictions, and not because an issue like the age of the earth isn't important. It is important. Why? It shapes how we understand Genesis, right? It shapes how we interact with modern science, like physics and cosmology and biology and geology and evolutionary science. It's not unimportant, but it is a secondary issue that sadly we often divide over. See what happens the moment I tell people, oh, I'm a young earther, oh, I'm an old earther. Sadly, in the minds of many Christians, they will put us in a box and treat us differently. Now, again, what we hold on that view is important. It matters. But I suspect when it's all said and done, what matters more than our particular view is the charity or lack thereof we show to people, especially Christians, who have a different view on this perspective. You've heard it said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. So how can you and I uh, disagree agreeably, hold different views with charity on important topics like the millennium, and not divide if we don't have to? I think one of the smartest ways strategically is to begin with common ground where we agree rather than begin with differences. The common ground builds bridges and it builds understanding. So I, uh, one of the things I've enjoyed over the past couple of years when COVID hit, I really started investing myself in my YouTube channel. And I get to interview primarily Christians. I just interviewed a fellow scholar who's an archeologist on the evidence for the Exodus. And we're often told there's no evidence for the Exodus. I was blown away at the case that he makes for the historicity of the traditional view of the Exodus. Like three days ago, interviewed him. But I also interview, I've interviewed skeptics, atheists, agnostics. And about six or eight, maybe 10 months ago, I interviewed a lady who described herself as the OG lesbian YouTuber. That's how she described herself. She's not a Christian. I reached out to her and asked if she'd have a conversation with somebody who saw the world differently. She agreed fascinating conversation. Well, I was just asking her questions. And at one point I said, hey, you grew up in a Catholic family. What was it like coming out to your father who's Catholic to say that you were a lesbian? And as best I can remember, she said something like, oh, he was great. He said, if God made you this way, he'd want you to be you, something like that. She goes, well, what do you think? I said, do you really want to know what I think? (laughs) Just to make sure. She goes, yes. Now, If that's not a divisive topic today, 
I'm not sure what is. I want to speak truth without compromise, but I want truth to be landed well. And I want to be loving. So quickly, I'm thinking in my mind, how do I navigate this? So I thought, well, let's find some common ground. I said, I actually agree with your dad that we are all made in God's image, that having a creator matters. He said, you were born that way. That's how the Bible starts, that God is our creator. Your dad and I see that similarly. In fact, I think the Christian story is it doesn't matter. Male, female, rich, poor, black, white, young, old, made in God's image has value. He said, but where I might differ with your dad is that's Genesis 1. When you get a few chapters in the Bible, the Bible also talks about sin and how the world and our bodies and desires have been affected by sin. So I'm reluctant to point to some attraction or desire somebody has and say it's necessarily God's will when the Christian story says the world has been marked by sin. As best as I can remember, that was my response. She goes, oh, that makes sense. That's fair. She said, as long as you're not saying gay people are uniquely sinful, I'm fine with that. I said, I'm not. Any Christian who tells you that doesn't take seriously the scriptures where Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And take a wild guess what all means in Greek. It means all. Yeah, there's nothing fancy to it. All means all. I don't always do this. And there's times I have to delete a tweet and apologize because these issues get heated. But my goal when I can is to find common ground with somebody. It builds bridges, the temperature goes down, and creates understanding. So what common ground exists across different views of the millennium? I think there's at least four things. Number one, that all Christians will participate in the millennial reality. Whether it's now or the future, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will experience this age of peace and prosperity. Nobody's going to get there and go, oh, I was pre-mill. I'm so disappointed. All oh, mills are right. We're going to be overwhelmed by the goodness of God that those differences are going to fade. So regardless of our view on this, all followers of Jesus will experience the millennial reality. Second, I think we should be cautious in interpreting numbers in Revelation too literally. Now, this might be an actual thousand years. It might be. It might be a long period of time. But numbers are symbolic. There's 144,000 followers of Christ, the 12 tribes, time, like maybe get there by numbers. Jesus portrayed as a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. There's, ten, there's a beast with 10 horns. You get the point. Is that Revelation is not a literalistic book. It's metaphorical. There's a lot of apocalyptic language. I think we should have humility approach in Revelation because there was prophecy that the Messiah would come. But a lot of it only makes sense when we look back when Jesus says, don't you know that the prophets were speaking of me? Once Jesus came, now we have clarity. So be careful interpreting it too literalistically, although in this case it could be an actual thousand years. Third, Jesus is not going to become king. He already is king. Can I get an amen? amen. Amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial. All believe Jesus is king, but he might reign in different ways at different times. Matthew 28 makes it clear when Jesus said, All authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. Jesus is not yet to become king, he is king right now. We all share that. In common. And fourth, the gospel changes things. The gospel changes lives. Whether or not you think the world will become Christianized before Jesus comes, we all agree that the gospel transforms lives and transforms families and transforms communities and can transform nations. If you just step back and think about this, regardless of our view on the millennium, we all should agree that every Christian will benefit and experience the millennial reality. Jesus is currently king and the gospel changes lives. If those aren't the essentials, I'm not sure what else to put in there. But we also have differences. 
So once we focus on what we have in common, it's easier to shift to where we differ. Where do we differ? Well, as we've seen, people differ on the nature and the timing of the millennial reign. Now, that's not an insignificant thing. I get that. That's where the difference lies. And there's also a difference over when the tribulation is and the nature of the tribulation, which is also controversial. And yep, Pastor Seth gets to teach on this coming up soon. So why is this important? Communication 101 is listen, build common ground, focus on what you have in common and move to differences. Take some of the issues we mentioned earlier, things like gun control. You know what's interesting is people in this congregation right now are going to have different views on this. But I know all of you here this morning and most people on all sides of this issue want less gun violence. They want to protect lives. They just differ over how to get there. I'm not saying all views are equal. We better get it right. But we can have much more charity with someone else with a different view when we start to understand why they hold that view. So how can we agree and disagree with charity? Well, realize a couple things. Number one, there is a time to divide and a time to call for repentance. I'm not saying let's hold hands and sing kumbaya. Unity is not at the expense of difference. Real unity and real love is when we differ and we look beyond our differences and still love one another. That's real unity. You say, How, where is that in the Bible? Well, just look in Revelation, what you studied a number of weeks ago, the letters to the seven churches. Who would Paul write to the church in Ephesus? He says they've abandoned their first love. What's his response? He says they need to repent. This is in Revelation chapter 2. And turn back to their good works. If not, John says, God will remove their lampstand. <laughs> John is very clear to the church in Ephesus. God is, again, through John. You've abandoned your first love. Stop sinning. Go do good works. We also see to the church at Pergamum, John says he has a few things against them. That they're teaching these teachings of Balaam and Balak. And what happens? that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. John says, therefore, repent. If not, I will come soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So Revelation, the very book we're in, is very clear. God's lampstand he's going to pull out if we're not living rightly. And he also says he's going to war against people who eat food offered to idols and practice sexual immorality, not to mention other heretical teachings. So there is a time to divide. There is a time for a prophetic word. But in my analysis, we're much more quickly to speak a prophetic word. We're much more quickly to divide than we are to look past our differences and try to find unity. So second, how do we interact with one another? Number one, know there's a time to divide, and that comes by wisdom. But I suggest we treat one another with more humility than we often do. I was just overseas, got back last week from vacation, and I was walking to the front of this hotel to get a can opener. And I asked the guy, he goes, hey, where are you from? I said, the U.S. He goes, oh, are you here to escape Trump? <laughs> Immediately. I said, I'm just here enjoying your beautiful country. He goes, oh, what do you think about Trump? I said, you know, these are really divisive issues. People are all over the map. Do you have a can opener? <laughs> he goes, well, let me tell you what I think about Trump and what you should think about him too. I'm not making this up. The moment I could somewhat graciously excuse myself, and I look, I'm an apologist. I don't mind a good debate and a good discussion, but I'm on vacation. I say, hey, thanks for the can opener. I walk away. He goes, stop, come back. Exact quote, listen, I'm not done educating you. Can you imagine that? I come to his country and he has the gall to tell me what I should think about a former president and his job is to educate me. Sadly, we're laughing because somewhat nervously, we've all done that, haven't we? The Bible has a lot to say about being slow to speak and quick to listen. He was more interested in educating than listening. Listening. 
teaching rather than learning, preaching rather than engaging. Now, I don't know his faith, but sadly, that put a sour taste in my mouth for his country. I'm not going to judge his whole country through that, but I thought, I hope I don't treat strangers like that. Let's approach each other with humility. Listen first. Understand first. As my father's taught me many times, it's more important to understand than to be understood. So let us approach issues like that with commitment to truth, but with humility, how we interact with one another inside the church and outside. And last, what this entire message is about, amidst the bowls of wrath and the beasts with horns and the judgment, the core message of Revelation is to focus on Jesus. Jesus is king. I think we divide on secondary issues because we forget who Jesus is, what he's done in our lives, and our call to love other fellow believers. We can talk about finding common ground and listening. When it's all said and done, it's much more of a heart issue than anything else. If we'd ask the question, how do we love God and love other people? And how do we have unity on the essentials and liberty on the non-essentials and charity? If we ask that first, we would care about truth about the millennium and understand that it matters. But even more importantly, show love to one another so people outside the church will know who we follow, namely Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father, thanks for this church that they're willing to talk about topics like this. And rather than taking one position, which at times can be fine, caring more about how we love one another amidst our differences. I pray if there's anybody here this morning who realize, whoa, this is describing me. I've been divisive. I've treated people this way. I've died on secondary issues. God, convict our hearts. Help us know what it means to love each other the way that you love us. God, we are so grateful and have much to be thankful for and praise in your name. Amen.